since you're the world expert in, uh, well, in many things, but one of them is phosphine, would it technically be correct to call you the queen of phosphine? I go for Dr. Phosphine. Queen is an inherited title, I yeah, feel. But you still uh, rule by um, love and power, so but while, while having the doctor title. Yeah, I got kindness. It. kindness. Kindness, kindness. In September 2020, you co-authored a paper announcing possible presence of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, and uh, that it may be a signature of extraterrestrial life. Big maybe. Big maybe. There was some pushback, of course, from the scientific community that followed, friendly, loving pushback. <laughs> um, then in January, another paper from uh, University of Wisconsin, I believe, confirmed the finding. So where do we stand in this saga, in this mystery of what the heck is going on uh, on Venus in terms of phosphine and in terms of aliens? Okay, let's try to break it down. Okay. The short answer is we don't know. Um, I think you and the rest of the public are now witnessing a pretty exciting discovery, but as it evolves, as it unfolds, um, we did not wait until we had you know, years of data from 10 different instruments across several layers of the atmosphere. We waited until we had two telescopes uh, with independent data months apart. But still, the data is weak. It's noisy, it's delicate, it's very much at the edge of instrument sensibility, sensitivity. And so we still don't even know if it is phosphine. We don't even really know if the signal is real. People still disagree about that. And I think it, at the most more philosophical end of how this happened, I think it is a distinction, and myself and other co-authors were talking about this, it's a distinction between hypothesis generation and hypothesis testing. Mm -hmm. Now, hypothesis testing is something that I think is the backbone of you know, the scientific method, but it has a problem, which is if you're looking through very noisy data and you want to test a hypothesis, you may, by mistake, create a spurious signal. The safest, more conservative approach is hypothesis generation. You see some data and you go, what's in there with no bias? Now, this is much safer, much more conservative. And when there's a lot of data, that's great. When there isn't, you can clean the noise and take out the signal with it. The signal with a bath water, whatever the equivalent of the <laughs> analogy would yeah. be. And so I think the healthy discourse that you described is exactly this. There are ways of processing the data, completely legitimate ways, checked by multiple people and experts, where the signal shows up and then phosphine is in the atmosphere of Venus and some where it doesn't. And then we disagree what that signal means. If it's real, and it is unambiguously phosphine, it is very exciting because we don't know how to explain it without life. But going from there to Venusians is still a huge jump. And so- Venusians, so that would be the, the title for the civilization if it is a, a living and thriving on Venus's Venusians. Until we know what they call themselves, um, that that's the name, yes. So this is the early analysis of data or a da uh, analysis of early data. It, it was nevertheless, you, you waited until the actual peer-reviewed publication to of announce? Of course, and analysis of the two different instruments months apart. So that's ALMA and JCMT, the two telescopes. I mean, it's still, I mean, it's really exciting. What, what did it feel like sort of sitting on this data? Like kind of anticipating the publication and wondering, and still wondering, is it, um, is it true? Like, how, how does it make you feel that a planet in our solar system might have phosphine in the atmosphere? It's nuts. It's absolutely <laughs> nuts. In a good, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> uh, in the best possible way? I've been working on phosphine for over a decade. And Before it was cool. Way before it was cool, <laughs> okay. um, before anyone could spell it or heard of it. And at the time, people either didn't know what phosphine was or only knew it for, for being just possibly the most horrendous molecule that ever graced the earth. And so no one was a fan. Um, and I had been considering looking for it because I did think it was an unusual and disgusting but very promising sound, sign of life. I've been looking for it everywhere. 
I really didn't think to look in the solar system. I thought it was all pretty rough around here uh, for for life. And so I wasn't even considering the solar system at all, never mind next door of Venus. It was only the lead author of the study, Jane Greaves, who thought to look in the clouds of Venus and then reached out to me to say, I don't know phosphine, but I know it's weird. Um, how weird is it? And the answer is very weird. And so the telescopes were looking at, so this is visual data. That's or, what you mean by visual. You wouldn't see the phosphine. Well, but I mean, it's uh, well, it's a telescope. It's remote. It's remote. You're observing, you're what, zooming in on this particular planet. I mean, what, what, what does the sensor actually look like? How many pixels are there? What does the data kind of look like? It'd be nice to kind of build up intuition of how little data we have based on which, I mean, if you look at like, I've just been reading a lot about gravitational waves and it's kind of incredible how from just very little, like probably the world's most precise uh, <laughs> instrument, we can derive some very foundational ideas about our early universe. And uh, in that same way, it's kind of incredible how much data, how much information you can get from just a few pixels. So what are we talking about here? in terms of um, based on which this paper saw possible signs of phosphine in the atmosphere? So phosphine, like every other molecule, has a unique spectroscopic fingerprint, meaning it rotates and it vibrates in special ways. I calculated how many of those ways it can rotate and vibrate, and it's 16.8 billion ways. What this means is that if you look at the spectrum of light, and that light has gone through phosphine gas on the other end, there should be 16.8 billion tiny marks left, indentations left in that spectrum. We found one of those on Venus, one of those 16.8 billion. So now the game is, can we find any of the other ones? <laughs> yeah. But they're really hard to spot. They're all in terrible places in the electromagnetic spectrum. And the instruments we use to find this one can't really find any other one. There's another one of the 16.8 billion we could find, but it would take many, many days of continuous observations, and that's not really in the cards right now. I mean, how do you, there's all kinds of noise, first of all. Yes. There's uh, all kinds of other signal. Mm -hmm. So how do you separate all of that out to pull out just this particular s signature uh, that's associated with phosphine? So the data kind of looks somewhat like a wave, mm -hmm. and a lot of that is noise, and it's a baseline. And so if you can figure out the exact shape of the wave, you can cancel that shape out, and you should be left with a straight line, and if there's something there, an absorption, so a, a signal. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. We tried to find out what was this baseline shape, cleaned it out, and got the signal. That's part of the problem. If you do this wrong, you can create a signal. But that signal, is at 8.904 wave numbers. Mm -hmm. And we actually have more digits than that, uh, but I don't remember by heart. And and ALMA in particular is a very, very good um, telescope, array of telescopes, and it can focus on exactly that frequency. And in that frequency, there are only two known molecules um, that absorb at all. So that's how we do it. We look at that exact spot where we know phosphine absorbs. The other molecule is SO2. If there is extraterrestrial life, whether it's on Venus or on uh, exoplanets where you looked before, how does that make you feel? How should it make us feel? Should we be scared? Should we be excited? Um, let's say it's not intelligent life. Let's say it's microbial life. It's uh, Is it a threat to us? Are we a threat to it? Or is it only, not only, but mostly a possibility to understand something fundamental, something beautiful about life in the uni in the universe? Hard to know. You would have to bring on a poet or a philosopher on the show. Uh, I You don't feel? I yeah. feel those things. I just don't know if those are the right things to feel. I don't certainly don't feel scared. I think it's rather silly to feel scared. Definitely don't touch them. Um, you know, sometimes in Work the movies, <laughs> you don't go near it. Don't interfere. Yeah. Uh, I think yes. one of the things with Venus is... Because of phosphine, now there is a chance that Venus is inhabited. And in that case, we shouldn't go there. 
we should be very careful with messing with them, um, bringing our own stuff there that contaminates it. And Venus has suffered enough. If there's life there, it's probably the remains of a living planet, the very last survivors of what once was potentially a thriving world. And so I don't want our first interaction with alien life to be a massacre. So I definitely wouldn't want to go near out of a, let's say, galactic responsibility, mm -hmm. <laughs> galactic ethics. And I often think of, you know, alien astronomers watching us and how disappointed they would be if we messed this up. So I really, I really want to be very careful with anything that could be life. But certainly I wouldn't be scared. Humans are plenty capable of killing one another. We don't, you know, we don't need extraterrestrial help yes. to destroy ourselves. Scared mostly of other humans. So, exactly. But these, this life, if there is life there, it does seem just like you said, it would be pretty rugged. It's like the cockroaches or, <laughs> or Chuck Norris. I don't know. It's the, uh, some kind of, um, it's something that survived through some very difficult conditions. That doesn't mean it would handle us. You know, it could be like War of the Worlds. Yeah. You come just because you're resilient in your own planet doesn't mean you can survive another. Even our extremophiles, which are very impressive, we should all be very proud of our extremophiles, they wouldn't really make it in the Venusian clouds. So I wouldn't expect, because you're tough, even Chuck Norris tough, that you would survive yeah. on a, an alien planet. Uh, and, and then from the scientific perspective, you don't want to pollute the, the data gathering process by sh showing up there. The observer can can affect the observed. Okay. How heartbreaking would it be if we found life on another planet and then we're like, oh, we we brought it with us. It was yeah. my sandwich. But that's but that's always the problem, right? And it's certainly a problem with Mars because we visited the that that if there is life on Mars or like remains of life on Mars, it's always going to be a question of like, well, maybe we planted it there. Let's not do the same with Venus. It's harder because when we try to go to Venus, it things melt very quickly. Yes. And so it's, pretty, uh, it, it's a little harder to pollute Venus. Um, it's very good at destroying foreigners. Yeah, well, in terms of Elon Musk and terraforming planets, uh, Mars is stop number one, and Venus maybe after that.